My name is David Van Vranken, and I want to welcome you to the 16th lecture here in the Chemistry 51C series at UC Irvine. 2011 was a banner year. I'm not sure if you guys remember. That was the year that Fragilariopsis cylindris was named Alga of the Year. How exciting! Actually, maybe most of you don't remember that. But here's a micrograph of Fragilariopsis that was taken by Dr. Karen Jung at UW. Uh, and what's amazing about this photograph is it shows Fragilariopsis in a very comfortable environment, which is in ice. And let me remind you that when you freeze human tissue or most animal tissue, the cells die. It leads to necrosis. I was going to show you some pretty horrific pictures of uh, human tissue that had been like, exposed to frostbite and what happens. But instead, let's go and talk about at a cellular level, why is it that ice is so lethal to cells? The problem is, there's a, several problems, is the hypothesis. One problem is that as you form ice crystals, the ice crystals themselves are sharp and they punch holes into the membranes of cells and then cause the, the guts to leak out of the cells and that's lethal. And the same thing can happen if you crystallize water that's inside the cells. Um, those sharp edges can damage and unfold and misfold proteins that are normally inside the cells. And a third major mechanism for, for killing cells and harming uh, living cells, it doesn't matter whether it's a bacterium or a human cell, is that as you freeze the water molecules outside the cell into ice, the concentration of the water decreases outside. And so water rushes out of the cells in order to maintain this osmotic uh, balance. And that dehydration of the cells, the water flowing out of the cells kills the cells. So how do animals and cells respond to that? It's, it's <clears throat> the organisms like Fragilariopsis have a mechanism clearly that allows them to cope with and sit comfortably in ice. Let's just remind ourselves of what's going on with ice. So if you can do anything to disrupt new water molecules from forming hydrogen bonds at that interface, then you can stop the formation of ice crystals. And that's the gimmick that organisms use in order to, um, in order to resist the formation of ice. And there's a class of proteins referred to as antifreeze, antifreeze proteins that serve this function. Uh, here's an example of an antifreeze protein that comes from the spruce budworm. So if you're an insect and you live outside when it's frosty, you don't want to just die. So it helps if you're producing antifreeze proteins that keep your cells from freezing. And so here's an antifreeze protein. And when you look on the bottom face, based on the way it's oriented here, of this antifreeze protein, you can see all of these threonine residues with hydroxyl groups specifically oriented and positioned at exactly the right distances to form hydrogen bonds on the surface of a growing ice sheet. And so these antifreeze proteins will stick to that growing interface of an ice crystal and prevent new water molecules from adding on. They kind of cap off that growing ice crystal. It's pretty ingenious, <laughs> pretty ingenious use of, of proteins to orient, very specifically orient hydrogen bonds to match um, an ice crystal. All right, let's go ahead and talk about the exciting stuff that we've got going on now in our course. Uh, <clears throat> we just are now starting a new chapter in our textbook. Uh, out of the, the chapters that we're covering in the Gorzinski smith textbook, we just finished a chapter on carboxylic acid derivatives. Boy, so many different functional group transformations that you can do between acid chlorides, esters, amides, carboxylic acids, um, nitriles. And you need to know all of that chemistry. You need to know those reactions. But we're doing a, we're making a major shift here, away from thinking about solely the reactions of things adding to carbonyls. We're going to look at the position right next door to a carbonyl and see how that can be a very effective nucleophile. But before we do that, I want to stop and bring you back to to there was a chapter on alkynes in our textbook. And in that chapter on alkynes, you were told that if you take a terminal acetylene, a terminal alkyne, it has a CH on the end. Those CHs are unusually acidic. 
not like a carboxylic acid acidic, but for acidic for a CH compound. And so acidic that they told you this weird base, sodium amide. And then you never talked about that base again, but they introduced this weird base, sodium amide, that seemed like the strangest thing on the planet that allowed you to, to pull off the proton here at this position and make and make carbanions out of terminal acetylenes. So this lone pair that's here on the nitrogen can is so basic, it can pull off that proton and make carbanions that were useful, you were told, for SN2 reactions. They're not as useful for SN2 as you were led to believe because they often give E2 elimination and no synthetic organic chemist likes mixtures, but, but you can use them for SN2 reactions if you're willing to accept some, uh, some E2 eliminations as a byproduct. So that was kind of your exciting start to making carbon-carbon bonds in, in the Gorzinski smith textbook is learning that you can make these acetylide anions and then use them as nucleophiles. And we're going to do something very similar with carbonyl compounds. We're going to deprotonate them using powerful bases and then use them as nucleophiles for making carbon-carbon bonds. So let's go ahead and take a look at how this works. So we're, <clears throat> what we're going to do is we're going to look at a very specific position. We're going to look at the carbon atom that is directly adjacent to the carbonyl. And here it is right here. That carbon atom right there is directly adjacent. And, and I'll talk about in a little bit that the farther away you get from the carbonyl, we, we label those positions as alpha, beta, gamma, delta, uh, using Greek lettering. Let's go and draw out the, the the mechanism um, for deprotonation uh, next, uh, next to the carbonyl group, uh, a deprotonation of one of the alpha protons, a proton on the alpha carbon. And I'll go ahead and draw out the arrow pushing mechanism for that. I'm going to draw it in two different ways, the same mechanism, two different ways, just to convince you that there's not, you know, there's not just one way to do this, there's two ways to do this. First way I'm going to show you to depict this, I'm going to simply deposit the electrons from that H carbon bond right there onto that alpha carbon. And so when we draw out this next intermediate, um, <clears throat> it, it's going to have a lone pair on the carbon. So here I'm going to draw the carbonyl group. And here I'll draw the H2, uh, the CH2 group. And then I'll depict in nice bold, with nice bold dots there, that carbanion that you generate by deprotonating with powerful bases. And now you can use that carbanion to make carbon-carbon bonds. It's so fantastic. Of course, you could use it for SN2 reactions. That's, um, that's one application. Let's go ahead and draw that out. Let me, let's suppose we took our alkyl iodide just as we did before, and we could use those electrons in that, in that alpha to that, um, to that carbonyl group. And then we can use that for carbon-carbon bond formation. Really exciting. I mean, synthetic organic chemists, organic chemists of all types love to form carbon-carbon bonds. That's really what, what got most organic chemists excited about organic chemistry, this idea that we can build um, molecules atom by atom and bond by bond and make bigger carbon frameworks. Now there's another way we could depict this same deprotonation process. So let me come down to the bottom um, and I'll show you the same reaction, and I'm just going to depict it in a different way. And it's a way that I think the book favors and many books favor. And, and what we're going to do is we're going to take this base and pull off the proton just as before. But instead of leaving the electrons in the HC bond on that carbon, we're going to bring those electrons all the way over and attack the carbonyl. That's why it's so easy to pull the proton off of there because that carbonyl is kind of absorbing all that electron density. And when we draw the the, the product of that, <clears throat> when we draw the product of that process, it's the same product that we drew up above here by deprotonating. And how can that be the same? Well, it can be the same because these are resonant structures of each other. And if they're resonant structures of each other, that means they're the same molecule. They're just different ways of depicting the same molecule. So I'll just write the word same right there. And anything we can do with the top resonant structure, we can do the same reactions with the bottom resonant structure. Watch, I'll take the same ethyl iodide here. That's ethyl iodide, it just looks kind of skewed a little bit. And, and I'll show that I can use this bottom depiction of, of what's called an enolate uh, for forming a carbon-carbon bond. Let me draw the, uh, the lone pair on this oxygen. That's where I'm going to start. And then I'll push the electrons here. And that's what makes this CC bond so unbelievably nucleophilic on that alpha carbon. 
Now it, it's frustrating because my, my next arrow is going to start from the middle of the double bond, but it's really, it's this carbon at the end that is the nucleophilic carbon in an enolate. So this is really the exciting thing we have here in this chapter is we're making these intermediates. These intermediates here are referred to as enolates. And here I've, 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 I've introduced you to this term. Chapter 23 is going to be about enolates. We're gonna have a whole chapter on enolates and enols. And um, then after this, we're gonna have another chapter on enolates. <laughs> they are so important in modern organic chemistry, it's hard to overstate the importance. And I've shown you that there's two ways equally good for depicting enolate chemistry. Uh, I kind of like the top way for, to, to, for people who are just starting off uh, learning about enolates, because you can see plain as day which carbon is nucleophilic. Whereas the book likes this bottom representation, and I think when you're just starting off, it's not as obvious which carbon is nucleophilic. So that's kind of why I, I tend to prefer this when I talk to uh, introductory organic chemists. Um, but when I talk to other organic chemists, I favor the bottom depiction here for an enolate. Okay, super exciting. Wow, we've spent so much time dilly-dallying in this book to get to the meat of organic chemistry and we're getting, we're getting closer here. Now I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna bring you back to chapter 11 again to talk about kind of like the, the precursor compound to an enolate in a way, the conceptual precursor to an enolate. And that's an enol. Enol is an alcohol. You can tell from the word enol. It's got an alkene. It's got an alcohol. It's called an enol. And you've seen them before. I don't know. If you, I'm not quite clear you would, if you would remember this, but there was this obscure reaction from chapter 11 where they told you if you wanted to add water to an alkyne like this, it, that was not re, that was, especially if it was a terminal alkyne where the two ends were not the same, you could selectively add H to this carbon and OH to this other carbon, if you use this, these magic conditions where it's sulfuric acid and water and you add catalytic sul mercury sulfate to that, right? Catalytic mercury sulfate, and you haven't seen mercury sulfate used anywhere else in the textbook or anywhere else in this course. And I don't think they showed you the mechanism for the reaction. It's unfortunate because it's a great mechanism. Um, but the product of that reaction initially is an enol that's not stable. That's kind of the theme for this chapter is that enols are not stable. And, and here's one tautomer. A tautomer is not a resonance structure. It's like two structures that differ in the position of a proton. That's a tautomer. And so this enol tautomer has a hydroxy group. That's the all. And here's the ene. So it's an enol. Is a, a, a tautomer. It's an, it, it's, a, it's an isomer of the keto form which has the carbonyl. And all we're really doing is we're moving this proton down to this carbon. Right now it's attached down to the carbon at the bottom. The keto form is more stable. So when you did these, these hydration of alkynes using the uh, mercuric, mercurinium, you know, the sulfuric acid water addition catalyzed by mercurinium ions, uh, you ended up getting the, a, a ketone as the product. A methyl ketone was the product in those reactions. So I don't, I don't think you would remember that, but now I'm reminding you of that in case you needed it somehow. But really the importance of this reaction, it, does, it allows us, it allows me to say, hey, you already knew about this enol, keto, tautomerism business, uh, but not as well as I want you to know. So let's, we're going to spend some time talking about that. Boy, you, you know, anytime you can form carbonyl bonds, you know, if you've, if you've got a choice between two structures that have the same number of atoms and one of them has a carbonyl bond, that's going to be the more stable compound. Right? You take things and you burn them and you generate carbon dioxide, which has two carbonyls in one tiny molecule. Um, that's really the downhill sink for organic chemistry. There's a couple of compounds where the enol form is more stable and they are super unusual. Super unusual. Let me, well, <clears throat> they're not structurally unusual, but it's unusual that an enol would be more stable than a keto form because carbonyls are so stable. Let me just remind you of the, the cases that you kind of already know where enols are stable. So one is phenol. Why is this more stable than the ketone form? Why is it so stable to have that double bond there instead of a CO double bond? Well, that's because it's aromatic, right? <laughs> so that, that's not a serious trick there. It's like, okay, that enol is stable because when you make the alkene form, the enol form, you end up with an aromatic ring. So, okay, that's not a brilliant trick. I'll show you one other class of compounds that have surprisingly stable enols instead of ketone forms. And 
I'm not sure if this would be totally obvious, but if you take a 1,3-dicarbonyl compound, which we're going to talk a lot about these uh, coming up, maybe in this chapter and certainly the next chapter, it turns out that it is more stable in the enol form. Let me go ahead and draw out this enol form. I'll draw it in equilibrium here. That the enol form is slightly more stable. It's amazing that it can have any stability, but the fact that it has any stability at all, instead of being a zillion to one in favor of the carbonyl, um, is pretty surprising. And so here's the, the structure of the enol. Why is that enol stable at all? If you look at the equilibrium for this, it's about one to three, so 75%. If you tried to make this 1,3 this dicarbonyl compound over here, and then you went and took an NMR, it would look like you got two products that you could never separate or purify, and that's because they're rapidly equilibrating back and forth. You're always going to have this 25-75 mixture whenever you make one or the other of these. So why should this enol be so stable? Well, there's two reasons here. One, one reason why that enol is so stable is that it's stabilized by a hydrogen bond. So that hydrogen bond, I'll just write H bond here, adds stability to the enol form. And you don't have any H bond like that in the keto form. And then finally over here, the other reason why this enol form is so stable is when we draw the enol, there's resonance stabilization. That lone pair can donate into this double bond, and that double bond can come over here and attack. And that resonance stabilization, so I'll just write resonance, those two factors, the hydrogen bond and that great resonance, you don't have those in the 1,3 dicarbonyl form. So that's why the 1,3 the, um, the, the, uh, dicarbonyls have significant enol content that you can often see in IR, you can see the OH stretch, or even in the NMR, there's, there's the other species can often be abundant enough to see. Okay, let's talk about how you go back and forth between the enol form and the keto form and the other way around. I'm gonna show you the mechanism backwards and forwards. It's a pretty uh, straightforward mechanism. And we're gonna look at the mechanism for the acid catalyzed tautomerization. Uh, to go between the keto form, that's this form over here, and the enol form. So the acid catalyzed tautomerization mechanism starts uh, with protonation of the carbonyl, kind of like you, you saw with forming acetals and Fischer esterification. So let's go ahead and uh, uh, protonate that carbonyl, just like that. And so now I'll go ahead and draw out that, uh, the next intermediate, which has the protonated carbonyl on there. And remember, I've got that A minus, uh, the conjugate base floating around there. I've got three bonds to oxygen. Don't forget to put a positive charge on that. Let me circle it just because I drew it so far away. <clears throat> okay, so now you could deprotonate the, the H from the carbonyl, but that'll just take you right back. What we're interested in doing is showing how we get the enol. And so it should be completely obvious to you that we've, we've pulled one of the protons off of this end carbon here. So let's go ahead and take a look at this. We're uh, going to draw out that deprotonation. There we go. Pull the proton off. Push these electrons all the way over to the carbonyl and attack the carbonyl. And that gives us the enol form. So we've lost a proton from that alpha position. <clears throat> now let's go ahead and draw the mechanism going backwards. I'm not going to add arrows to the top one, I, I, it, just because it would be too confusing to have two sets of, of curved arrows. So I'm going to drop down below and we'll go backwards. So how do I draw the mechanism going backwards? The, the important thing to remember about enols and um, enolates is that this is the reactive site. That's the reactive site. And it's reactive because the lone pairs on that, on that oxygen are pushing down into the alkene and making the alkene more reactive on the end carbon. So I'm going to protonate that alkene. This is a, an easier protonation of an alkene than any alkene that you did back in chapter 10 in the Grzynski Smith textbook. We're now going to protonate that. You know, the correct way to depict this is you show the, this, this arrow coming from the middle of the bond. Don't be wishy-washy about that. Make that arrow start right there from the middle of the bond. Um, and it's frustrating because you might be thinking, well, I want the arrow to make it clear. I want the arrow to show that I'm protonating the end carbon. Well, that's not the way curved arrows work. You have to start it from the middle of the pi bond. That's, that's the rule for arrow pushing. Okay, let's give the electrons in that HA bond back to the conjugate acid. Now, 
the intermediate here has to be the same. It, it can't go through a different intermediate going backwards and forwards in a, in, in a mechanism. So let me draw out the same intermediate. It's gotta be exactly the same. Might be a different resonance structure, but it's, it will be the same intermediate. And this, the way I drew it here, it's gonna give the same resonance structure of this intermediate. Okay, so that's the same intermediate. Let me circle the charge just so it looks even more the same. And now I'd go back, I'm going backwards. So let's do the last step going backwards. So now I need to deprotonate. Uh, and this time I'll deprotonate the oxygen here. And there we go. And that takes us right back. So under acidic, if you've got catalytic acids and it, it doesn't have to be a strong, <laughs> right? Anything with an H, the glassware with an H can catalyze uh, a, um, this keto enol tautomerism. You can't stop the tautomerism um, and the equilibrium is governed by stability of the, of the two tautomers. You don't really control that. Now their bases can also catalyze tautomerization and the book has an entire section about that. But you know, once you stick a base in with a, a carbonyl compound, enols are not important species. I'm not going to talk about the base catalyzed enol mechanism. Once I put a base in with a carbon heel, it's the enolate that's gonna be doing all the work in there. No, there's no point in discussing base catalyzed ketoenol tautomerism. Um, what's important is to talk about bases forming enolates. That's the important thing. <clears throat> all right, let's talk about these different positions of a carbonyl compound. Uh, the, the carbon atom that is directly adjacent to the carbonyl is referred to as the alpha carbon is this Greek lettering. One carbon further, that's beta. One carbon further, that's gamma. Biochemists use the same kind of labeling scheme when they label amino acids. Amino acids have a carbonyl and the carbon next to the carbonyl of an amino acid is called the alpha carbon and there's a beta, gamma, et cetera. Uh, so there's nothing uh, unusual about that nomenclature. Now, one and only one position can be deprotonated easily, and that's the alpha position. That's this position right here. You can't pull protons out the beta position or the gamma position. That carbonyl makes it easy to pull protons off of the carbon that is next door. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. Let's go ahead and draw out an example where I've got some sort of a species uh, that can be deprotonated. I'll take this molecule called acetophenone. Um, here's a molecule that's easily deprotonated. If you put this in with a base, let me just put in base B minus, we're gonna get an enolate out of this. And if I ask you what happened and you tell me that you formed a CC double bond, you're not seeing the whole picture. You know, I, I find that the students who have uh, trouble in chemistry 51C will invariably focus on that CC double bond and not see the thing that is just staring them in the face. What happened in this transformation? You pulled off a proton. <laughs> That's what happened in this transformation. And just because we don't draw that proton, here it is, we don't draw any of the three protons on there, you should still be able to see that. It should be as plain as the nose on my face that a proton got removed from that carbon. That's what happened in that reaction, is that you removed a proton. Let's go ahead and draw the arrow pushing mechanism. If you start to forget where the protons are located, you're not gonna make it. I mean, I really expect you to see every single proton on every molecule that it, the ones that are not drawn, that we don't draw the protons on carbon anymore. We, we fully expect that you've practiced drawing Lewis structures enough that you know where the protons are located. So here's the uh, one way to depict that. This time I'm depicting it where, where we push the electrons all the way to the carbonyl. And there we go. And now we end up with this enolate species. Let me just write that out, enolate. It's such an important species for this chapter and the next chapter. And as soon as I see an enolate, I want to use it for carbon-carbon bond formation. I just can't resist. So let me go and throw in an electrophile here. We'll, we'll do an electrophile for SN2, methyl iodide. That's a pretty straightforward electro, electrophile for SN2. Love it. And let's go and draw out the, what would happen? You're going to form a carbon-carbon bond. You, you might have this tendency to think, oh my gosh, I've got to form a bond with that O minus. It's got a minus. No, the, the lone pairs on, on this enolate oxygen are certainly reactive, but instead of attacking the methyl iodide, they're pushing down into this alkene part and making the enolate alpha carbon super reactive, right? You form a carbon-carbon bond and it's this carbon right here, that one that I'm circling and highlighting, that's the carbon that's super reactive. So when we draw out the product for this process, 
we're going to have a beautiful carbon-carbon bond there. And there's our methyl. And the iodide will just float away and get washed away in the workup. Nobody cares about that. <clears throat> okay, so what kinds of bases should we use to make these enolates? Sounds like a pretty good deal. We're going to, from this chapter forward, you're going to be making a bunch of anions, carbanions, enolates, and using them to form carbon-carbon bonds. We better pick our base that we're going to use. Unfortunately, at this stage, probably the most, the if I say strong base, you probably think hydroxide. Oh my gosh. Or T-butoxide. <laughs> Lame. Let's go ahead and talk about what the, what the challenge here is. The challenge is we need to depronate a, a, a ketone. And the pKa for these kinds of protons here is somewhere around 20. You know, it, it varies a little bit from, you know, I just kind of estimate that acetone has a pK of around 20. It's not exactly right, but it's an easy number for me to, to, to remember. And that's the one I would ask you to remember for a ketone. Those protons have a pK of about 20. You can't use just hydroxide anion to deprotonate that. You can't just use potassium debutoxide to deprotonate that in high yield. It, it's not basic enough. It's not basic enough to efficiently deprotonate in order to give an enolate. So if we tried to do this, if we tried to deprotonate this, we would only, using T-butoxide, we would only get a yield of about 1% of the enolate. And this would be an equilibrium. Most of your carbonyl compound would just be sitting there. This would go back and forth and back and forth, but 99% at any point in time, once you reach equilibrium, 99% of your, of your ketone just sitting there staring at you. That, that's not the way to do organic chemistry efficiently. Um, if you really want to make an enolate, you need to rip that proton off of there with a base that is so powerful that it has no problems pulling off that proton. And, and here's the base we're going to use. You've never seen it before. Um, it's called lithium isopropyl amide. So it's an amide anion. <clears throat> it's unfortunate because the word amide kind of sounds like a carboxylic acid functional group. So I usually pronounce it differently. I call it amide, whereas I call a carbonyl with a nitrogen an amide. Um, but you know, I'm not sure that you're supposed to pronounce them differently. I just try to do that on purpose. So when you use lithium disopropyl amide, an amide base, Boy, if I could have had a microscope, I might draw a tiny backwards reaction, but there's no backwards reaction here. When you rip off protons using, using amide bases, wow, now we're talking here. I guess it's the same product that I drew above. The difference is the yield, right? It's greater than, right, 99.99999. I don't know how many nines I'd have to draw. A whole page full of nines. That's 100% yield. That's how you make an enolate using an amide base. And so let's go ahead and talk a little bit about, the, um, about these bases. How, how would I know that an amide is more basic? Well, you could get a clue from looking at uh, the conjugate acids that are formed once you deprotonate. Uh, alcohols, or even this, this is not a very acidic alcohol, T-butanol has a pKa of about 18. A uh, little less acidic than, than water, which is 16. But an, an amide, an, an amine, to form an amide anion from an amine, right? Now we're talking a pKa around 38, 35 is a, like a, depends on what the alkyl groups are, right? These are log orders, 17 log orders, 10 to the 17 is different in basicity. That's what that looking at the conjugate acid tells you. It tells you an order of magnitude, it tells you that this amide anion down here, is about 17 orders of magnitude more basic than potassium T-butoxide or sodium hydroxide or any of those things you used to use as bases. <laughs> okay, not all carbonyl compounds have equal acidity. So I'm gonna show you how acidity varies and I expect you to memorize these numbers. And I hope you, you understand the trends. The general trend we're going to see here is caused by the fact that when we look at carbo carbonyl groups that have lone pairs next door, like these lone pairs, when, when you have lone pairs donating into the carbonyl, it's harder to deprotonate on the other side because the carbonyl is already busy sucking up electron density on this side, so makes it harder to suck up electron density by deprotonation. So when you have lone pairs on one side, it makes it harder to donate 
to deprotonate on the other side. And the better this lone pair is at, at donating, well, then the harder it's gonna be to pull the proton off. So the hardest carbonyl compound to pull a proton off of the alpha carbon is when there's an amide, right? That these, the, the lone pairs on this nitrogen, nitrogen and lone pairs are strong nucleophilic lone pairs. So they donate into the carbonyl. Very hard to deprotonate. So you end up with a high pKa. So let me go over here and um, just write out um, pKa. That's what I expect you to, to, to remember here. This is a pK of 30. That doesn't mean high or low to you until you compare it to the others. Um, if, if I look at an ester that has oxygen lone pairs there, well, that has a pKa of 25. Uh, let's save the nitrile for a little bit later. And then finally, when I get to a ketone, it's about 20. It's not exactly 20, but I feel like it's easier to remember 30, 25, and 20. So I always use the number 20, and it always works for me. So if you wanted to remember, memorize some number like 21.1 or 19.7, go to it. But I'm going to use 20. <laughs> and then finally, in aldehydes, right? there's no donation of any type fr from from this aldehyde H over here, it's very easy to deprotonate. So the pK, it's about a thousand times, whoops, let me use my uh, red pen. It's three orders of magnitude easier to deprotonate than the corresponding ketone. Boy, aldehydes can be actually kind of a pain in the rear to work with because they're so easy to deprotonate and make enolates with. All right, so um, it turns out, you, you just have to memorize this. Nitriles behave a little bit. The, the nitrile is a little bit like a carbonyl, and it has, it, it's about the same to deprotonate as an ester. So it's 25. So it's the one uh, group here that's not a carbonyl, um, and it's about, um, it, 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 those CH3s are about as acidic as an ester CH3. Now, if you have two carbonyls, and there's a CH2 right in between them, it's very easy to pull that proton off because you have two carbonyls helping to acidify it. So let's come down here and we'll look at the, a diester. So when you've got two carbonyls, uh, it turns out that the pKa for these dicarbonyl compounds are low. That's 13. That's amazing, the implication of that. That's less than water. That means if you make the anion and you put it in water, the water is not acidic enough to protonate that. Man, and you can use bases like T-butoxide to deprotonate um, all of the ones on this side over here. You can use T-butoxide to get over 99% yield for deprotonation. Whereas any of these other derivatives over here where you've got one carbonyl group for, or a nitrile, one carbonyl group, one carbonyl group, one carbonyl, those you have to use an amide base to deprotonate. Powerful, powerful bases. Okay, if I have one, right, esters are harder depro to deprotonate than ketones. What if I have an ester and a ketone, or, or what if I have two ketones? Well, now it's more acidic. Ketones are more acidic than, um, ketones are more acidic than esters. And when you've got two ketones, it's way more acidic. It's got a pK of nine. Man, you're starting to get close to seven there, which um, I guess the implications of that are, would come from the henderson hasselbach equation under equilibrating conditions. And when you have one ester on one side and a ketone on the other, guess what? It's right in between. That's satisfying, right? <clears throat> so it's, it's halfway in between. So all of, these, all of these dicarbonyl species over here are so acidic. The carbon is so acidic in between uh, that you can deprotonate them with potassium T-butoxide. Um, but that's not really, that's kind of old fashioned chemistry. Uh, I'll talk about that, uh, I think, a little bit later. That would be really be stepping backwards. Okay, <clears throat> let's go and talk about some reactions of enolates. It, it, generally, just the general idea here is if you make an enolate, if you go through the trouble of ripping a proton off of the, the methyl, some, some alkyl group that's next to a carbonyl. So um, I, I guess it doesn't matter how I, how I depict it. I'll use this depiction. That's the common one that the book uses, right? This, this carbon here is super reactive. And you want to jealously guard this reagent once you make it because you want to be able to use that carbon for making carbon-carbon bonds. But if you expose that to water, to alcohols, or anything like that, unfortunately, you're simply going to put a proton right back on that carbon and you won't be able to get it off unless you use a powerful base. So once you make an enolate, you want to avoid this. You want to avoid this from happening. 
If, if that's what you want to happen, why did you make the enolate in the first place? As long as you can avoid this fast process, the fast deprotonation, this is our goal for this chapter, is make enolates and don't protonate them again. Instead, use those enolates for CC bond formation. That's what we're trying to do in this chapter. Make enolates and then use them to make CC bonds. You could have iodide leaving groups. You could have bromide leaving groups. You could have tosylate leaving groups, um, epoxides, ring opening. Uh, and next chapter, we're going to attack carbonyls. Yeah. Okay, so this is chapter 23. We're going to make enolates in chapter 23. We're going to avoid exposing them to, to water unless they're for some reason super stable. And then when we get to chapter 24, we're going to make enolates using powerful amide bases. And then we're going to use them to attack carbonyls. So that's what we're doing with enolates. We're making them and then we're using them to form carbon-carbon bonds. And there's another kind of related reaction we're gonna show you in chapter 24. It's a little bit weird looking. Um, let me go ahead and draw it out for you so you can see this other reaction we're going to see with, e with enolates. But it's only a reaction that, that's good for stabilized enolates. So in other words, we need to have two carbonyls stabilizing that kind of carbanion. And it turns out that those are going to react kind of like cuprates did. Remember cuprates, how if you take an enone like this, the cuprate doesn't add to the carbonyl, it adds to the beta carbon. And this is what these stabilized enolates do, is they add uh, to the, <clears throat> they add not to the carbonyl group, they add to the beta carbon. And you know, I'll, I'll just put, put the electrons right there for now. That's what cuprates did and it was kind of exceptional. There's one last reaction that we're gonna teach you in this chapter that is not a reaction of enolates. It's a reaction of enols, and it's just kind of gets jammed into this chapter. So coming up here in this chapter, we're going to teach you a very, where if we take electrophiles that are very powerful, um, like bromine, bromine is so powerful, it just adds to simple double bonds with nothing else around. So of course it can react with an enol. Enols are nowhere near as reactive as enolates, um, <clears throat> but they're way more reactive than simple alkenes. And so Hope you wouldn't be surprised that you can brominate um, an enol. What's surprising is that mechanism doesn't go through this cyclic three member ring bromonium ion that, that you might have learned about. All right, let's talk about this super powerful base, lithium diisopropyl amide. I mean, it's so refreshing to get to, to something that is, that is really used in, um, in modern organic synthesis. I'm going to go ahead and draw out this uh, lithium diisopropyl amide. It's an amide base that should look to you like sodium amide that you learned about in the alkyne chapter. So I hope when I draw this out, it kind of reminds you of NaNH2. So NaNH2 looks like this, even if you never drew the Lewis structure uh, back in chapter 11. I hope that lithium looks like sodium and uh, an alkalamine looks a little bit like H2N. Those are, have about the same basicity. And the way to think about, you were told to think about sodium amide, you were told to think about it like this, kind of like it's, like it's a, 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 a naked anion, right? That, man, nitrogen is nowhere near as electronegative as oxygen. So it's, well, when you make that amine anion, it is super basic. And, and this lithium amide base that I've got over here, lithium diisopropyl amide, um, it, it, super powerful, just like sodium amide. These bases, these amide bases are, I don't even know what this is. It's not, a, um, it's not a million, it's not a billion, it's not a trillion, it's not a quintillion. I don't even know what those numbers are beyond there. Uh, my, my friend, Kevin Judice uh, uh, from Texas, he's a scientist. Amazing scientist. <laughs> he had a word that he used one time. I'm going to borrow it. I'm going to steal his word. Thanks, Kevin. The word is a bazillion. <laughs> when it gets so big that you don't even, you just call it a bazillion. Man, way more basic than hydroxide anion or t-butoxide anion. A bazillion times more basic than those. So, um, yeah, so it's really just far more basic. I'll just, I'll just write that down here. Way more basic way more, a bazillion times more basic 
than just a, a humble alkoxide, way more basic than sodium hydroxide, way more basic than potassium t-butoxide, like that just, right, it's one followed by a, a bunch of zeros. So you're gonna have to get over thinking the potassium t-butoxide was this hot stuff base, because that's nothing. Um, these amide anion bases are super powerful. And the, the thing that, that's special about the lithium diisopropyl amide, which is used so commonly that we abbreviate it. No chemist says lithium diisopropyl amide. That's why it doesn't roll off my tongue. Um, we just say LDA and it's so common. Everybody just writes LDA and they don't write the chemical structure. They don't write the lone pairs. Um, it is super basic. And you'll notice those isopropyl groups on there. It's super hindered. And that's the the, the properties of, of LDA. Super powerful and super hindered. Okay, so how are we gonna use LDA? LDA has this exceptional property that if you take a ketone where the two sides just differ in steric hindrance, they have the same acidity, but they're just different because they have different numbers of alkyl groups. LDA is so hindered and choosy that it will deprotonate on the less hindered side. So these two sides have about the same pKa for H's that are over on this carbon and H's over here, but one side is just more hindered and that those isopropyl groups are so encumbering on LDA that you can selectively deprotonate over here on this side. Now, I know you can't see that I pulled off a proton. I, I hope you can. You lost an H in that reaction I just drew up. So <clears throat> the other possible product that you don't see when you use LDA it would be this one. And that's pretty remarkable. LDA selectively gives you this product over here. Let me go ahead and write this out so just to impress you with, you get 100% of this enolate and you get 0% of this one. And why is that exceptional? Because when you look at the, the stability of these enolates, the one that you get is actually the less stable enolate. The, the less stable enolate is the one that forms. Now, if you're thinking about carbocations, it's like, oh yeah, more stable things always form faster. More stable carbocations form faster. More, you know, more stable products only form faster about half the time. So if you're stuck in this carbocation mode, you're going to think that more stable things always form faster. It's not true. And with enolates, it's a perfect example. The more stable enolate forms more slowly. And that that may seem counterintuitive. You stick with organic chemistry a few more years, and you'll see that's totally that's just as common as 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 more stable things forming more quickly. Let me give you another example where that this is the you could have guessed which which of these is more stable because just in general, whenever you take alkenes, whoops, let me go ahead and change back to just a black drawing pen here. Whenever you take alkenes. I can't remember where you might have learned this, but if you have two different alkenes that have the same number of C's, H's, uh, the same molecular formula, here's two alkenes, both five carbon alkenes, and the only difference is the degree of substitution. One of these alkenes is disubstituted, one of them is tri-substituted, and more substituted alkenes, if you could equilibrate them with acid or something, more substituted alkenes will tend to be more stable. Let me write this with the red pen, just like I did before. This is just a general rule. Anytime you have more stable alkenes, stable, and less stable alkenes are, are less, less substituted alkenes are less stable. And, and enolates are alkenes. So it shouldn't have surprised you that the more substituted enolate should be more stable. The thing you could never have guessed is that LDA is so hindered that the less stable enolate forms faster. Whenever you have, again, the, the key is that when you've got both sides of about equal acidity, the methyl group doesn't really change the pKa, but it does make it more crowded. So that should be counterintuitive because you're used to thinking that more stable carbocations form faster and therefore more stable everything forms faster. It's not true. All right, we're going to stop right there. You guys have uh, been patient. Um, and when we come back, we're going to learn more about enolates and enols and their chemistry.